God made us for himself. He made us for heaven. But becoming who God made us to be requires a spiritual journey. The church sometimes refers to this journey as metanoia, which means ongoing conversion. And today we'll discuss what this journey of metanoia looks like with Father Dave Pavanka, TOR, President of Franciscan University and host of Metanoia, an 11-part video series from the Ministry of the Wild Goose and 4PM Media. I'm Dr. Bob Rice, Professor of Catechetics at Franciscan University in Steubenville, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Rice, a catechetics professor here at Franciscan University of Steubenville. And today we're talking about metanoia. I'm joined by our panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, a theology professor here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization here at Franciscan. And we are pleased to welcome our special guest, Father Dave Pavanka, TOR, a well-known Catholic speaker and author who serves as the president of Franciscan University of Steubenville. Father Pavanka has written six books, including Breath of God, Living a Life Led by the Holy Spirit, and Sign of Contradiction. Through the ministry of the Wild Goose, he has also produced several evangelistic films and video series, including Sign of Contradiction and Metanoia, which will be the topic of today's discussion. Father Dave, welcome. It's, 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 it's Great to be with you. Yeah, it's great yeah, to be with you too. It's one of my favorite topics, so this is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's talk about, about that a little bit. So metanoia, I mean, it means conversion in the tr basic translation of the word, yet you don't call it conversion, you call it metanoia. Is there something deeper? Well, yeah, it, it means conversion, but it's it's so much more than that. It's, it's conversion, it's turning, it's repentance, it's a process, it's a journey, but it all ultimately, whatever words we're using to explain it, it's all leading us back to Jesus. So this invitation, which everybody is given mm. to metanoia, uh, is a turning back to Jesus. So at the very beginning of the scriptures, Jesus says, repent, the word is metanoia, the kingdom of God is at hand. So this invitation from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry is this invitation that you've been given, we've all been given, to metanoia, to experience this metanoia. So you're just not impressing us with your Greek uh, references. No, I, I know about four words in Greek, and, and this <laughs> but is But you know, there are some foreign words that you can't really no, find a substitute right. for, like logos. Right. Uh, it means word, truth, meaning, ground. And you're right about metanoia, it has this, uh, this uh, uh, variety of uh, connotations. Right, it's funny, even the, the title, we, we went back and forth about whether or not to use it, because it's somewhat of an unfamiliar word, and yet it's such a powerful word, why not learn about it and use this, just literally take this opportunity to teach and to evangelize with the meaning and the grace and the power that is in the Word of God. So, Literally, it means the change of mind, right. but when you use the word mind, it evokes the sense of, oh, I just changed my mind. I'm going to vote Democrat right, instead right, of right, Republican right. or something like that. But the notion of noose has something much, much deeper. You know, it's sort of echoed in Latin because in Latin we have ratio and we have intellectus. And even though the English word intellect is sort of like, you know, the rational faculty, ratio is the Latin term that, you know, for discursive reasoning, for proof, argumentation, whereas intellectus in Latin is the organ of contemplation yeah. where you're actually sort of like considering reality and taking it in and allowing it to change you. And I think metanoia has that deeper sense yeah. that you're not just thinking, right. you are really taking and pondering, contemplating yeah. like, oh my goodness, reality is other than what I thought it is, Jesus is the Lord. Right. Yeah. Right. And so everything changes. Yeah. In, uh, in Joseph uh, Ratzinger's book, that uh, trailblazing work, in Fundamental Theology, Introduction to Christianity. It's the text that I think maybe Scott and I cut our theological mm -hmm. choppers on. But he uses uh, the term metanoia uh, as reversal. You're on this train headed for perdition and you need to get off and move in the other direction, 
reverse engines. Uh, the direction is taking you to a disaster. Right. And I think that's the sense that you want to convey in, in these marvelous conferences right. you've put together. Exactly, and, and not only that, that, that there's, there's lots of moments in our life. That's one of the things I love about the idea or the, the word of metanoia. It's not a singular event. It's, a, it's also the main charism of my Franciscan community, yeah. this idea of metanoia, but, but we're always on that journey that we're never right. complete. I remember when I was here at the university one time, I was talking to a student and, and, and inviting her to conversion, and, and I would later find out that she was frustrated. She said, I've already been converted. Well, this process of conversion, <laughs> of metanoia is, so what we want to do is take a look at lots of different areas in our life that the Lord wants us right. to change, to turn, to be able to, to, yeah. to move on. That, that's a recurrent uh, problem, I think, here. Uh, students who have a, a, a Kairos experience on sure. the weekend. Uh, I met God or the Blessed Mother, and now it's Tuesday, and I feel as if I'm an atheist again. <laughs> what happened? It's a process. Sure, absolutely. It's not over in a day. Absolutely. If you don't mind, I want to just emphasize this even more because you know, this is, I think, the single most distinctive feature of my experience in becoming Catholic and being Catholic for over 30 years. You know, there's Mary, there's the Pope, there's the Eucharist, but this theology of conversion is ongoing. Mm. In some ways is the single most unexpected thing in becoming Catholic. I, I, I was just uh, up in Grove City recently for our 40th reunion of our Young Life group. Mm. And it was so cool to get together with the leaders and the kids who are now in their 50s. Uh, and we were reminiscing about their conversion experience. And listening to them, I realized that they are basically echoing the exact same basic jargon of their initial conversion, which is awesome. Absolutely. You know, it really is. Jesus is Lord. They've given their lives. But the idea of ongoing conversion, you, you get a sense that when you have this experience in, in fifth grade, you know, that you just keep coming back to it. But you're supposed to have it in sixth grade and seventh and right. every single year, every single day, taking up your cross is always an invitation to conversion because it, it doesn't start getting light right. or painless or well, easy. Well, it's not unlike falling in love. Uh, I mean, Scott, you and I can both, and Bob, Whoa. testify to the I fact. Falling in love. I mean, <laughs> with, well, yes. I just got thrown in at the end. <laughs> it felt like that. An addendum. <laughs> but, right. but I mean, Augustine says this is the greatest love uh, uh, romance uh, uh, imaginable, to fall headlong in love with Jesus. But it's like any relationship of love. I mean, you can't say to your wife, well, look, didn't I tell you I loved you 20 years ago when we tied the knot? Why do I have to keep repeating myself? I don't want to get redundant. But no, you have to renew it every day. It's fresh. There was a great story of one of the friars, uh, I can't honestly remember if it was his 50 years vows or ordination, but they had asked him, when did you decide to become a friar? Uh, and he said about five years oh. ago. But his point was, was that there's this continual choosing the Lord and choosing the life. And I think this is what Metanoia invites us to. Yeah. Some people might look at that with, I don't know, some frustration or being I don't know, weighty, but it's actually, it's, it causes me to have hope. This mm -hmm. idea that this conversion, this Metanoia is a constant process that I'm not, I'm not despairing, I'm not anxious that it's never done. I'm actually hopeful that, right, it's, yeah. that it's not done, that the Lord is continually inviting me to something yeah. new every day. I think in many ways, though, we want it to be done. I think it maybe right. it's just part of human nature. We, we want to hit that plateau. Right. You know, as you said, that person's frustration. I, I wrote a song a number of years ago called Unfinished, which was basically about metanoia. Yeah, you really us. must sing it to us. Uh, yeah, well, later, 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 later. I got my, I'll pull my accordion out. Um, Much later. But I remember, I remember uh, a woman came up to me and she was so angry at that song. She hated the idea that we were unfinished, that God is still working his work in us, which implies that there's work to be done right, yeah. in, in our life. And, and I think in many ways, you know, if you've had that initial conversion experience, though many haven't, I would say, yeah. uh, but even for those that have, they can fall into sure. what St. John Paul II called a, a mediocre prayer life, like not realize the richness right. yeah. that there's, there's more, you know, there, there's more than just that first moment right. of saying yes to Jesus, just like there's more to a relationship than yeah. having a great first date. And it seems like that's at the heart it of is. what examining metanoia is about. You're absolutely right. If, if we think about it, unfortunately, there is a population of, of Catholics who their religious formation, their experiences of the Lord stopped fifth or sixth grade, mm -hmm. you know, confirmation. Imagine if the rest of your life stopped at, right. yep. you know, even in high school, this idea that I've got God figured out, 
got it all taken care of. <laughs> I find that frightening, you know? It's like, <laughs> I've got it all. But this, this continual opening and continual being present to the Lord and seeing that He wants to do something new in each one of us. Yeah. Somebody yeah. said that uh, the mediocre are always at their best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it induces a kind of smugness, which is really corrupting. Mm -hmm. I, I finished with you, Lord. I, I, I have unpuzzled the mystery. I'm at the end of it. So there's nothing else mm -hmm. I need to do. I mean, that's the end of the affair. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as the Scanlon professor of the new evangelization, you know, what is so new about the new evangelization is precisely this, the call to ongoing conversion, that we're sinning every day, so we ought to be repenting every day, and repentance isn't just listing the sins that we've committed, but turning back to our Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I can't help but think that, you know, if you look at somebody who has, you know, they're in their 50s, but their intelligence is basically stuck at the level of fifth or sixth yeah. grade. You'd look at a profound handicap. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, intellectually, socially, emotionally. Well, why isn't that diagnosed spiritually? Because I think it is the single greatest problem in the church today. The gospel that we heard that caused conversion at one point or another is so inexhaustible. In teaching it, I have to recognize that more than a teacher or an apostle, I'm a disciple and a student. And this, what John Paul called Eucharistic amazement. You know, I, I love to put myself in the position of unbelievers who are staring at a wafer that others are worshiping. And it's like, yeah, yeah. okay, I, I get it, you know? Uh, we think that's the creator of the universe and the redeemer as well, body, blood, soul, and divinity. I suddenly have a heart for these unbelievers, but also I have a deep gratitude for the gift of faith that I can affirm the real presence of Christ. It's like, let's get on with it. Let's go further up and further in, you know. If, if we could just go back to your comment about what happened at Grove. So how, how, do, you, how do you speak to that? You know, this, this person who feels stuck, like they've had their conversion, like how did you speak to that with that population? I mean, I didn't have much of an opportunity okay. because they're all evangelical Protestants who were very uncomfortable with the fact that I was the most anti-Catholic <laughs> and now I'm the most Catholic, you know. Praise but, the Lord. Yeah, but I mean, everywhere I go, I have an opportunity to, to share. And I think what happens is Catholics hear the faith from the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know this. Yeah. And they're like, oh my goodness, we're skimming the surface. Absolutely. Why water ski when you can deep sea dive? Right. Yeah. And a lot of the ways I experience it when I travel and speak is just clearly proclaiming Jesus. Right. I think many, many times we can get caught up in uh, religious jargon that misses the fact that we are actually talking about a person. Exactly. You know, metanoia isn't about making ourselves better, you know, or just it's not, not sinning as much. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Right. It's, it's about an encounter with a living person, yeah. Jesus Christ. Theological right. jargon, too. Yes, right. indeed. Yeah. But, the, but the, that, that encounter with the Christ, one thing I love what Pope Francis said, he invited everybody to an encounter with Christ or to a renewed encounter with Christ. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we do, we rest on an experience that's 30 years old. And, and I can think of my own life. There were these markers in my life that were significant, the encounters of Christ that changed me, that changed the direction, the very direction of my life. And yet there's been lots of those. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been lots of those. And we, and we need to continue to pray for that renewed encounter for yeah. those who have. Yeah, I think I read that same meditation by yeah. uh, Pope Francis. Yeah. Uh, and the second half is pretty telling. I mean, ideally, the encounter with Christ, that's what you need. Uh, and, and you need to uh, renew and nourish it afresh every day. But if you can't do that, at least remain open yeah. to the possibility that God might surprise you, ambush you yeah. uh, one quiet afternoon. Yeah. hit you over the head with grace. Yeah. And I think that's at the heart of that idea of this metanoia, that God does want to continue to surprise us. There's right. something yeah. new for us today. Yeah. But it needs us, and I can't remember who said it, about being able to pray and to be present to the Lord and allow ourselves a space to actually encounter Him. Right. I think in some ways it's just letting people know that there is actually more out there. Yeah. I think sometimes, again, you just yeah. have your Catholic experience. You could even be going to daily Mass. You could pray your rosary. You could, you could be in a wonderful routine. Um, but even that without... Yeah, that, yeah, that's the danger when you routinize uh, mm -hmm. your faith. It's not that you reach too high and you can't make it, but you're willing to reach very low because you can make it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an invitation to a boring life. You know, St. Augustine is named Doctor of Grace. And what's curious is that he recognized his need for grace and that's how he converted. But as he got older, 
you know, he recognized that he needs grace now more than he did back then. Mm -hmm. Now we think, well, that's rhetorical. But he didn't think so. He really yeah. believed that as he got older, he got weaker, and Christ had to get stronger in order for him to really cross well, the finish I think, line. I think there's a paradox to that, that, that I've dealt with a lot of people that as they're growing in their faith life, they get frustrated that they feel like they're sinning. But the more we come, the closer we come to the light, the more we recognize, the more we're able to see. So that that's not a bad thing. That's actually a really beautiful, good, hope-filled thing. Yeah. 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 Right. Amen. Well, when we return, uh, we will continue this conversation. So please stay with us as Franciscan University Presents continues. Metanoia for me always makes me think back to my Christian Moral Principle class freshman year where we learned about uh, this word and turning back essentially towards God each and every day and how it's built into the Franciscan charisms. And for me, it really, it makes a lot of sense to me that God would want to see us um, continually evolving that relationship with him on more of a friendship basis where it's a daily thing. You're always turning and orienting back towards God. Um, and so for me, that means in daily prayer that there is uh, an aspect of daily prayer that's always first reorienting ourselves back towards God in everything we do. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith and reason, wisdom and grace, mercy and truth. You'll study under world-class scholars and seasoned practitioners who are committed to Christ and His church. With over 40 majors and pre-professional programs, you'll find the formation you need to succeed. At Franciscan University, you'll find more than just a college. You'll find yourself in an educational experience as singular as you are. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're talking about metanoia with Father Dave Pavanka. Uh, our first segment we talked about just the idea of what metanoia is, but Maybe you could just talk a little bit about these videos that you created. Like what, That's great. That's, what, was, what was the thought behind it? Or? Well, the thought behind it was that, and just the way you, you phrased it was really wonderful, because uh, metanoia should be a lived experience. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I was wrestling with as I was praying and developing this project, was that we use words like conversion, but what does it really mean? And, and we can make it that it's just an idea, but it ought to be a reality. And then the other part, going with the idea that metanoia is this process, is there are lots of conversions in our life. So what we really do is, actually it was really a beautiful opportunity. We filmed the whole series in the Holy Land, because I thought to be where Jesus was and, and where he gave these teachings would be um, just a, a special bonus. It's so beautiful, that land is yeah. holy, right? right. <laughs> it's, it's just anointed. So, so some of the topics that we deal with, and, and the first one, the very first one is, Jesus goes to Caesarea Philippi, and he asks his disciples, who do, you say, who do they say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And I think that is the primary fundamental point of conversion for us, is that, mm -hmm. that wrestling with, on one level, what does the world say? But he obviously brings that back to them. And, and who do you say that I am? Yeah. And that's, again, I, my, my experience is that a lot of people, when you begin to speak about their relationship with Christ or who they believe Christ to be, it's often, not always, often, well, this person said this, or, or the Holy right. Father says this, or Father yeah. says this, but there has to be, or, or here on campus, mm -hmm. my mom and dad always said this, there has to be this moment that we stand before Jesus and we answer that question for ourselves. Who do you say that it's I It's got to be pretty convicting if it's put to you by Christ Himself. Yeah. Who do you <laughs> right, say absolutely, that I Right, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and the fact that it's done uh, in a place that is surrounded by false gods, exactly. kind of bogus idols, makes it, I, I think, all the more arresting. Right, it wasn't just coincidence that Jesus took them <laughs> there. It was what that area represented for them. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, Peter is the one who answers, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And yet, Peter also becomes exhibit A of ongoing conversion. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking of Garrigou Lagrange's book on the three ages of the interior life and the shorter form of it, where he uses Peter to show the stages of conversion and how they line up with the purgative, with the illuminative, and with the unitive, so that you move from the penitent to the proficient to the perfect. And that can become nomenclature, that mm -hmm. can just become subject matter. But for Peter, it was, his heart had to break 
over and over again in order for him to want Jesus' heart. You know, so you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Lamb of God. You're the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Alpha and the Omega. You are the King, the Physician, the Creator of the universe, the Redeemer. You are friend. Hope and glory. Right. You know, and I mean, to enter more deeply into that friendship, you know, it makes most happy marriages pale in comparison, right. you know. At least that's what we should do. And, you know, I'm also thinking of Paul who describes himself in terms of an athlete. And, you know, you don't say, well, a year ago I had my best time and so it's downhill from here. You keep trying to better your time and get closer to it. But it is instructive that after uh, making these wonderful, stupendous announcements about who Jesus is, Peter should go on to deny him three right. times. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, I think that, that sort of endears him to us because we're doing it all the time. Sure. Or more proximately, to rebuke him. Immediately, you know, right, yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> Get, Get thee behind me, <laughs> Satan. You know, it's like the conversion and then the reversion is almost instantaneous, you know. What are some of the other topics uh, of the videos? Well, and that's, again, the, what we want to do is make sure that we understand that there are all different kinds of conversions and areas. So, one of the main ones that we spend is the rich young man runs to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So, if the first question was Jesus asking us, who do you say that I am? The next question we have to ask is, okay, well, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's this, you know, some questions just have more power, more weight. That seems to me Everybody who's watching, everybody who's paying attention to this needs to be able to answer that question. Okay, who do we say that Jesus is? Okay, um, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This was a person who followed the commandments, who was eager to get the answer, you know, uh, and then goes, and then ultimately what Jesus asks him, it's not necessarily what he asks everybody from that perspective, uh, about giving away all that he has. Yeah. But what we must all do is, is follow Jesus. Yeah. And what he's going to invite us to is to surrender and this is a scary prayer, to surrender whatever keeps us away from Jesus. I mean, what must we do to inherit eternal life? We must follow Jesus, we must be in relationship with Him, and we must give up anything that keeps right. us away from Him. Well, you're exactly right, Father, that the two questions are really joined at the hip. Mm. I mean, once you acknowledge, yes, Jesus, you're the Son of the living God, uh, He's entitled to ask you, well, what are you going to do about it? Right. Are you going to follow me right, right. all the way to the cross? and then you go away sad right. because you've got all these distractions. Yeah. No, I agree. I think, honestly, that having thought and prayed over that, that text, I think, honestly, it is one of the more troubling, sad, distressing stories in the Scripture. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this person runs after, in, in Mark it says he runs up to Jesus such so that he's being motivated. Before he leaves Jericho, I just need to ask you one thing. Okay, I've been thinking about this for a couple of days. Yeah. I just need to know one thing. Yeah. What do I... And, and Jesus, it's important, I think, Jesus looks on him with love, because yeah. okay, there's one more thing. And um, just maybe, maybe just one step back, is he also says follow the commandments. That's a part of it, right? So right. It, it's, it's important that we do that, and then this is the other thing you need to do. But it looks as if but, he observed the first part. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. But it just breaks right. it shows how necessary right. that is. Right. And right. in right. a way, right. the, right. the right. sadness he evinces, I think, is very healthy. It's salutary. He ought to be sad. Yeah. I mean, Thomas, St. Thomas speaks of sadness as the awareness of an absentee good. He doesn't yet yeah. have it, and it leaves him sad, that yeah. emptiness. I mean, that's really a sign of our greatness. I know that I'm empty. I'm a beggar. I need more. Right. But what it, what it spoke to me and what maybe what, what I prayed over is, is, is in, it's necessary that we follow the commandments. But it's not just a checklist, right? right. It's not just a checklist. It's, it's following the commandments in relationship, in mm -hmm. relationship with the one who loves us, in the relationship with the one who is our Lord and our Savior. Uh, and there's a way that this is an opportunity for conversion. It's not just right. going through the motions, but it's, it's being in relationship with you know, And it shows how irrational sin is. Obviously, when you break commandments, you're really destroying, you're harming yourself. But he goes away sad because there's something subtle about his own irrational sin at that point. He's sad because of all that he thinks he has to give up. Mm. But if you just compare that yeah, to absolutely. what you would get absolutely. instead, right. cost, benefit, analysis would show you that it's going to be much more rational to forsake this to get that, to let go of the pennies, the dimes, and the nickels to get the big bills, as it were. Right, right. Well, and I'm glad you even mentioned, you know, part of the, the challenge of that story, sometimes I think particularly in a very consumeristic society in which we live, you hear that, you know, gospel read from the pulpit and you go, am I supposed to sell everything? Right. And uh, that isn't always the major obstacle. I mean, the invitation 
was to be a follower. I mean, if any of us could go back in time, I'm sure we would all pick right. 2,000 years ago, and, and we would do whatever it took yeah. to actually see him, hear him, follow in, well, in we his might, footsteps. Well, we might have been Judas. But would we? Yeah, right? That's right, but would we? Yeah. But what are some of the other obstacles that, that you see in your preaching ministry and maybe you even address sure. in that particular Well, video? one of the things that we spend quite a bit of time with, and again, just this sense of conversion is that uh, if, if we, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. So if there's a kingdom of God at hand, there's an ushering in and Jesus ushers in a new kingdom, but it's coming in direct conflict with another kingdom and that is the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. So we spend quite a bit of time just talking about that, that part of this conversion process for us is I think to have a greater awareness of, of the power of the evil one, the power of darkness, the reality of those. Now in comparison to the power of Christ, it's, it's nothing, but <clears throat> we need to go, we need to I think have a deeper understanding that this is a battle that we're a part of, that, that we're entering into something. And if we're not aware of that, if we're totally clueless to that, we're easy pickings, you know, if we're not, if, if we don't understand that more profoundly. So that's another area of conversion. Each of the different parts is just an area of conversion. That's one that we spend qu quite a bit of time with. You know, that one also kind of bears emphasis, you know, because... <laughs> yes. I, I, think I think they think, all do, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I believe that most folks suppose that they're like Switzerland. That is, in the great conflict, they're neutral. Yeah, you know, there is no such when thing. in fact there is no, no neutrality. And 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 mm -hmm. Saint Paul describes his former life and basically conjoins himself to the Gentiles that we were in darkness, we were dead, we were in this kingdom of evil, and you know the Ephesians, whether they're Jews or Greeks, they had to convert, and in the process they discover I wasn't neutral, I was subject, I was blinded, I was deceived. Right. And I didn't know it. Right, yeah, right. not to choose is to choose. Right, I know here you're neither hot nor cold, something right, yeah, like that, right? That's right. Uh, Baudelaire has a great line. He said, the cleverest ruse of the devil uh, is to convince people he doesn't exist. Right. Uh, and once you do that, uh, you're, you're in his thrall. Right. Uh, and we have seen, I mean, the horrors of the last century are not entirely due to human folly. Absolutely. There is an evil intelligence at work. And he's not a symbol. Satan is not a symbol, yeah. despite what a couple of chuckle-headed uh, theologians no, uh, sure. may think. Sure. He's real. Sure. And that's really what we desire is, is not, not to be afraid of him because the power that Christ has given to us is the power over the, over the enemy. So we need to be able to claim that, but to be aware of it. And that's really, in many ways, the, the, the series is just that, is trying to help us become more aware of all of the areas that, it's, sometimes I think we put Jesus in this, this is my Sunday, but the rest of the week, he doesn't necessarily have anything to do with it. And what, what we're trying to or bring people to understand is that he wants to have to do every area of our life. Yeah. Christ wants to be able to intervene in that. Like one of the things we, we jokingly called it, he said what? And that is this idea that some of the things that Jesus says are startling. Hmm. You know, some of the things he says are offensive. I mean, we live in a world today that you can't offend anyone. There's the, one of the stories we talk about is when the scribes of the Pharisees come up to Jesus and said, when you said that, we found that offensive. And Jesus goes, well, let get this. And he goes into this. <laughs> but that's important that, that some of the things that Jesus says are really difficult. You know, he says, wide is the road that leads to hell. Narrow is the road that leads to heaven. The vast majority of people have that absolutely uh, opposite. It's a wiser, everybody's basically going to go to heaven. It's just not what Jesus said. Now, that's a hard teaching. That's yeah. a hard word. Yeah. Nowadays, that would be a trigger. Right. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. need a safe space. Yeah, You're yeah. disturbing the comfort yeah. zone. Yeah. yeah. But that we can't hide from that reality is yeah. that Jesus says things that are, are very pointed and, right. and asks a great deal of us. Yeah. Was there anything as you were filming, uh, particularly in the Holy Land, that might have been a kind of metanoia experience for you as you were bringing these stories to life in these various sacred and holy places? Well, yeah, that's, that's a great question, Bob. Um, I, I think I always think one of my favorite places is on the Sea of Galilee, and, and I've been able to be the Holy Land a number of times, and, and there's just some wonderful, beautiful places in Jerusalem, but there's something about being on the Sea of Galilee, watching the sun rise, and just this, this deeper understanding of that God actually became man. He actually came, he walked around this lake. He was on this water. And obviously I knew that before. It's not like I didn't, oh geez. But Matt Noe is, is coming 
to a deeper understanding and a deeper reality. One, one of the things that we're talking about this is that God becomes flesh. This is this whole idea, this metanoia, this understanding that God takes on flesh. So that was another moment of conversion for me, to watch the sun rise over the sea that Jesus calmed and the sea that Peter walked on and to be there and be present to that. And then the next question, maybe we'll talk about it more later, is, okay, so what difference does that make? Right. Yeah. right? What difference does that Gosh, make? Gosh, it has to make a difference. I mean, it must. I think of Tertullian, who's uh, quoted uh, in Gaudium et Spes, the famous article 22. Tertullian says, the word assumed the slime of the earth and, and then turned it into something sublime. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's pretty jarring. Yeah. That's stupefying mm-hmm. that God became man uh, and dwells among men as a man. Right. I mean, that's arresting. Right, and, and, the, and the, to the degree that we understand that and that becomes more a part of our life and our daily existence, it changes our, Im, impacts our relationship with God uh, and with Christ, but it also should impact our relationship with one another. Mm. And this is one of the things I think, that the conversion isn't merely our relationship with God, but it's my relationship. The fact that, that Christ takes on flesh should change the way that I treat you and, and the way right, that I speak right. to you. And yeah. that's in, in some ways the harder part of conversion for me. Yeah. The, the, your, your, spou- I'm not, your spouses, and not that there would be any, any reason to change the way you treat your spouses, no. but hypothetically. Hypothetically. Yeah. We've hypothetically. got it all together. Other yeah. couples. Yeah, yeah, some couples, right. Yeah. Well, when we come back, we will continue to talk about metanoia and even some specific practical ways that we can all uh, continue on this journey of ongoing conversion. Stay with us. An often overlooked point about conversion in the New Testament particularly is that the call to conversion, this metanoia, means a change of mind. And it's always situated within a call to a specific vocation in life. In the New Testament, the verbs to follow Jesus, akalotheo, is used to illustrate that. So one takes up his way of life as one takes up his mission and fulfills his commandments. You don't have to trade top flight academic programs for a passionately Catholic identity. You can have both. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll not only deepen your faith, you'll be prepared for real world success by dedicated professors for whom excellence isn't just a goal, but the standard. Ready to get started? Check out franciscan.edu. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents and we are coming to you from the Communication Arts Studio here on the campus of Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and equipment and my colleagues, Dr. Regis Martin and Dr. Scott Hahn, are guiding our discussion on metanoia with Father Dave Pavanka, President of Franciscan University. So we've talked a lot about the video series, we've talked about what metanoia is, but I think the real question we all want to know is, what do we need to do to stay on this journey? What are some of the, you know, are there main practices or ways in which we can continue to foster a deeper conversion to Jesus? Well, I think just even the way you put it, this this journey. I think it's important for us to recognize that, that it is a journey. And some of the images I use are seasons, that we have seasons in our life, but to recognize that it's not just a spiritual day or a spiritual week, it's Mm. a spiritual life, and to be able to see that. I mean, some of the things that I think are really important for us is, and you mentioned earlier, Bob, that uh, if if you haven't had that encounter with Christ, I mean, that's that's really, in many ways, the beginning of this. So if if people are watching this and that's like, yeah, I, I don't know. Pray for that, you know, pray that Christ becomes real, He becomes personal, that He becomes our, our Lord and our Savior. And then once that, that begins to take root in our heart, I mean, there's lots of things. One of them is, is simply by praying. We, we spend some time, uh, Jesus' scripture says He goes to a deserted place. I mean, think about that, that, that God Himself goes to a deserted place. So we spent some of the time filming this actually in a deserted place where Jesus might have gone, but we also, did some work at the wall, at the temple wall, that, that Jesus prayed in a deserted place, and Jesus prayed in the temple, and Jesus prayed in the synagogue. and So this, this life of prayer is really incumbent on us, on a, on a life of conversion. You know, if, if what Jesus was doing was more than pantomime, like I'm on the stage and I want to kind of be an exemplar that you can see what I'm doing so that you'll do it too. I mean, if Jesus actually thought he needed 
to get off right. alone <laughs> and pray. Right, right. Okay. Who do we think we are? <laughs> right. you know? yeah, but I'm really busy, all right? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. You're setting a good example, and I appreciate that. But I, I think it reflects back on us. You know, yeah. I, I mentioned earlier this 40-year reunion, and I remember 40 years ago going to a small Christian college. And uh, our line back then was, small Christian colleges often make small Christians. <laughs> because when commencement comes, you know, it's over. I, I've had my education. And they stop studying, they stop reading, and that kind of thing. Or it's not just true for students, I think it's true for professors. Right. When I get my doctorate or when I get tenure, I'm going to recycle my notes. And, and there's no longer that fresh encounter with yeah. Jesus hmm. that, you know, in certain sense can become inconvenient. Right. Because here I am, Lord, I'm up on stage sanctifying your people. And he's whispering, I would prefer to sanctify you yeah. more right. Right. than That's to right. use you yeah. more to sanctify Absolutely. others. And like, well, okay, that would mean getting off alone and yeah, praying. Yeah. And like, like, well, it, and it's a different approach of prayer, right? I mean, it's yeah. a, when, you, when you see your faith life as a relationship with Jesus Christ, then there's a reason to pray. If, you, if your faith life is just about being a good person, you almost treat prayer like working out, right. which is you do it enough to be as strong as you think you need to be, but then when you're yeah. weak, oh, I need to hit the gym again. And that's not really what this whole thing right. is about. Right. It's about, it's, a, it's an adventure in love, yeah. you know, and it's a, it's a deeper intimacy, uh, which is really at the, you know, the, the greatest gift that he what, gives us what, to call us what friends. What I, I find reassuring is that when Jesus does disappear uh, and communes uh, with the Father in silence, alone with the alone. He's talking to the same guy mm -hmm. that you and I Absolutely. are enjoined Absolutely. to address. Absolutely. The one prayer that Jesus uh, sort of dictates, invents, as the poet Peggy puts, it becomes an outpost so that God the Father can no longer inflict stern justice. He now has this Our Father prayer, which means he has to show mercy. I mean, I mean that's not strictly uh, mm -hmm. speaking true, but you know, granted the poetic license, Jesus becomes the mercy of the Father, the extension of, of His love. And we contact this, we plug into this reservoir of mercy precisely by speaking the Our Father. And I find that one petition, give us this day our daily bread, to be absolutely pivotal, because it's the acknowledgement that I haven't got anything. I need the bread of meaning the bread of life. I'm not interested in a donut or a piece of toast. I want Logos. I want God. And that's how I get it. Sure. And, and when you take a look at the text in the scriptures where the crowd is looking for the bread, right? They just want to see another miracle, multiply right. something else. Yeah. And Jesus is saying that I could actually give you something that, you'd, you, that would, sat, would really satisfy you. And, and you'd and never be hungry again. Right, to your point, Bob, I think that's one of them is that, is that it's I think we, we continually need a conversion, a metanoia to the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, that, that ultimately that is what's going to be able to sustain me, that it, it, you used earlier, it, it's not just a wafer, right? And, right? and I think there is too many people that really struggle with that and this deeper understanding. Over the years when I was younger, the text, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, mm -hmm. was, was my mantra in some of these. But, but the more I prayed that, the more I was open to that, the Lord breaks into my heart and gives me a deeper love for Him and His presence in the Eucharist. For many, that's a moment of conversion, this, this time that we recognize that the Almighty, Omnipotent, All Holy, All Majestic God, present, Wow. That's conversion. Well, isn't that why it's so lamentable that among Catholics there is little lively conviction about the real presence sure. of the Eucharist? Well, what can we do about that? I mean, there's a, an area where metanoia has to take place. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, uh, this recent study that came out from the Pew Research Center that indicates approximately 30% of Catholics believe in the real presence, that 70% think it's merely symbolic, at one level represents a, a failure of catechesis, and yet upon closer examination, you could also say, perhaps somewhat cynically, that it represents a success of catechetical mm. uh, experimentation, because since the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the idea that the that the Eucharist, you know, is transfinalized or transsignified, you know, signified all of the, all of the experimentation, you know, this is the result of that, right. you know. Yeah. But again, a call to conversion is back to the basics, mm -hmm. because you know, becoming man, obviously, God wants to get close to us. 
but by making bread himself and inviting us to consume him, that takes intimacy to an unbelievable level yeah. where you have to believe the unbelievable in order to contain the uncontainable. And it's like, Lord, I am not worthy. Right. You know, I do find daunting that line, you know, give us this bread, but I find even more daunting, forgive us our trespasses. Right. You know, and when I think about that when we're praying it right before communion, who do we exclude? Forgive us our trespasses. Who is us? Well, it's Catholics. It's mm -hmm. faithful. It's conservative. No, it's all of us. us. You know, we're not just out to reach them. Yeah. We are them. And so forgive all of us. Our so who is there left for me not to right. forgive yeah, if I've just, I'm, not, I'm lying in the second half if I'm not right. forgiving. Uh, and, and it's like, what a challenge. And then to go forward to receive the God man, right. yeah. you know, it's like, I really can relate to unbelievers. You know, it's like, well, thank just, God just, for the Just gift as we things. all conspired to crucify Christ, we have all been forgiven. We've all been invited uh, to the banquet. He yeah. breaks himself to become bread. Yeah. And, and maybe in a way it, it, it commends the honesty of those who stay away because they don't believe. Why would you want to go to Mass just to have a piece of bread? I mean, it's not very tasty. It's pretty insipid. If it's the bread of life, if it's God, then how can you possibly stay away? Sure. Cardinal Wright's line, you know, it's a meal. It's not even a snack. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I do think that this Eucharist is like the test of faith. I mean, it really yeah. mm -hmm. is yeah. for us an invitation to ongoing conversion, you know. So Absolutely. the morning offering in the beginning of the, the day is a conversion, you know. I go to weekly confession generally, and Kimberly has never suggested it's too frequent, <laughs> you know. And then an e you know an evening of recollection once a month, a retreat once a year, and this is barely enough. Right. Right. You know, I, I still find myself deceiving myself. You yeah. know, one of the images I had when I was praying one time was of, forgive me, Tarzan going through the jungle, right, mm -hmm. and, and grabbing onto the, the vine and just as he's about to let go, he gets the next one. I mean, that's this Eucharist that, that right, from, right. from Eucharist to Eucharist that just keeps us going, keeps us from falling. But I'm the vine, you, yeah, true vine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you both made allusion, and we really haven't talked about it yet, is the, the nature of mercy, in, in that that's another area of, of conversion necessary for us, is that God is profoundly merciful. Mm -hmm. and, and I love the image when, when they bring the, the person that, who's crippled, and they place him before Jesus. And Jesus looks at this crippled man. They know, everyone knows what they want him to do, right? Jesus healed right. this person. But the first thing he does is he says, your sins are forgiven. Yeah. At that moment, the most important thing is that his sins are forgiven. And this is another moment of conversion for us, that, that the Lord desires, he looks upon us and he, he rejoices, he celebrates in us being able to come and, and allow him to be merciful to us. I love what Pope Francis says, that, that, that the Lord never tires of giving mercy, but we tire of asking for it. Right. Yeah. We ought not, that, that we continually go before the Lord. One of our friars, God bless him, rest his soul, he would always say, don't be discouraged. Whenever you come to confession, don't be discouraged, don't be discouraged. But yeah. back to the evil one, right? Wants us to be discouraged, that, that God can't forgive me this time. I've, I've right. gone too many times, or it's been too long. Right. The Lord's mercy is always new. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes of St. John Paul II on his uh, document on the mercy of God is he says that mercy is an indispensable element of God's love. It is, as it were, love's second name. Mm, that's and, and his entire connection is that we receive God's love through mercy. That's actually the very means by which, and of course the name of Jesus, God saves. You know, that, that mercy really at the, at the very heart of it. And, you know, that, the quote of Francis just reminded me, you know, I had an opportunity of that year of mercy to read through the diary of, of St. Faustina. Mm -hmm. And over and over again, the, the words of Jesus were saying, the, the problem isn't a lack of my mercy, it's a lack of your trust in my mercy. Yeah, exactly. Like that is, exactly. I mean, and, and so many churches have that beautiful image, Jesus, I trust in you. And I don't think many people realize what the trust is in, and it's a trust in His mercy, because once we despair of His mercy, it's over. It's over. Like we, we yeah. really, you know, are, are out, you know, we're miss, you know, we're, we're believing the lies of the devil, and right. we're missing uh, the depth. Right, right. You know. I think one of the most subtle lies of the devil is this idea that, you know, you've been a, a Catholic Christian for so long, you're supposed to be at the point where you need less and less mercy, mm -hmm. you right. know, and yeah. it's like, no, actually, it's again re reviving what Augustine said, I need more and more grace. Mm. And this idea that 
well, you know, if I'm really growing in holiness, then I do need less and less mercy, and I could probably receive more and more justice, yeah, yeah, like yeah. a duck <laughs> in yeah, yeah, missile, yeah, yeah. you know? That is so dangerous just and the, deadly the, as self-deception goes. The prayer, I just recently had the opportunity to go to Fatima, and the prayer is, you know, only Jesus forgive us our sins, especially those who are most in need of your mercy. And there's a way it's, especially those who are in most need of your mercy. It's like, especially those who are in of most in need of your mercy, right? right? Yes. Yeah. I, I, always, am those I, I always now say those of us who are in most yeah, need yeah, of thy exactly, mercy. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I'm, no. So prayer, mercy, Eucharist, what are some other uh, things that you've seen or maybe that series addresses in terms of a way to just continue on this path of metanoia? Well, I think part of it is also uh, a deeper understanding of the body of Christ that, that we, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about the, the Eucharistic elements, but the body of Christ is also you and it's me and it's the people that we go to parish and, and community and worship and mass with that uh, I think oftentimes we need a conversion in that area, that understanding that we are the body, that, that we are not competition to each other, we are not the enemy. Uh, there's a way that the evil one is causing us to look at different groups, you know, this, this group or this person is the enemy. No, we are the body of Christ. Uh, recently, I believe it was Augustine in the office of reading, in, in essence, to paraphrase, uh, that you might look at an individual part of the body and wish that they weren't there, but they are there, right? <laughs> they are there. And, and the invitation, the moment of conversion is for us to be able to embrace the body, understanding we are earthen vessel but the body of Jesus is, is present in our brothers and sisters. Yeah. Wow. Well, he thought so highly of the body that he assumed one. Indeed, yeah. indeed, yeah. yeah. You know, I think of the, one of the titles of Satan in the book of Revelation is the accuser that of brothers. That is so key. Right. And I think that many times, you know, it's part, of our, it's part of our culture, our climate, particularly in the United States, is to, it's us versus them, it's pointing fingers, it's dividing, and, and we can just as easily do that within the church, we can Absolutely. do that within our parishes, we can do that within our pews, we can do that within our families. Absolutely. You know, Accusing all of those. Another? I know, it's hard to believe. <laughs> Unthinkable. It's, it's the Rice family thing, it's not a Han thing. I, I yeah, don't what's know. wrong with the world? And Chesterton writes, I am. I am. Begin yeah. with yourself. Right, right. Then you can blame your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, when we come back, we're going to have some final thoughts on this ongoing journey of metanoia, so please uh, stay with us. ongoing conversion is really seeking out the Lord, for example, through prayer, through the sacraments, um, through letting the Lord change my own heart, through, um, for example, the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of the Eucharist, um, by personal prayer, by letting the Lord um, change my heart, for, by giving Him the permission to change my heart. The point I want to make about conversion, the call to metanoia, is that it's always a response to divine presence, His grace. He's present offering Himself, and he, in that moment He also is making the call of His plan or His will to which we one responds. So all of the legal pronouncements, all of the commandments that we have are situated in that biblical situation of God revealing Himself revealing His plan and offering the divine grace that's necessary to respond to Himself. It's not simply a matter of one's personal will or strength that empowers one to turn to God or to stop sinning this way or that way. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. Regis, could you start us off with your thoughts? Yeah, uh, there's a, a story that uh, Luigi Giussani tells uh, in the religious sense, and I'm thinking about it because I'm in the midst of this blockbuster biography of his life. It's about 1,600 pages, mm -hmm. so it's Light, written by an reading. Italian. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, uh, he, he recounts a, a confession he heard uh, as a very young priest. And, and the kid who came in had been sent by his mother, who said, look, Johnny, you've got to go to confession. And shortly after arriving, it became clear that Johnny had no faith. But he was full of beans, and he said, look, priest, what you're trying to tell me isn't nearly as important as what I'm about to tell you. You can't deny that the true greatness of man is captured by Capaneus, who's this giant uh, who's uh, uh, bound to a rock in hell by God. This is in Dante's Inferno. But Capaneus 
blasphemes God. And he said, God, I can't escape, but you can't prevent me from spitting in your eye, hating you. And uh, the penitent says to Father Giussani, that's the true greatness of man, to be able to spit in God's eye. And Father Giussani, after recovering from this <laughs> shock, says, wouldn't it be even greater to love the infinite, to bow down before God? And the kid was spellbound by that, stunned. And for the next two months, uh, he's, uh, he's tormented. And then finally, he returns to the sacraments, and he becomes very devout. And within a month, he's killed in an automobile accident. Mm -hmm. But Giussani extracts from that story uh, the following principle, that the two ways of being human are either authentically religious or the anarchist. If man is a finite being in relation to the infinite God, then you've got two choices. You either make yourself infinite, the anarchist, you absolutize yourself and your appetites, or you bend the knee before the real infinite, God himself. And it seems to me that that's what all metanoia is about, to sort of edge us in the direction of acknowledging that there is this absolute other and he assumed a human form. Mm -hmm. He's got a name. Amen. Amen. Scott. Uh, picking up where you left off, Regis, you know, the, the one who is authentically religious, uh, I think soon, soon finds himself surprised uh, the fact that he's not becoming empirically holy, verifiably so, you know. And, and I think, you know, you mentioned before the break this, the role of the devil as accuser, the accuser of the brethren. And I, and I think it's a, it's a struggle for all of us to recognize that we're still failing. We still need mercy and maybe more of it. You know, I, I'm reminded of the saying that sort of paraphrases Augustine that there, there is no saint in heaven without a past, and so there is no sinner on earth without a future. And whenever the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But it isn't just a kind of, you know, back and forth. It really is looking into the eyes of Jesus and contemplating the face of the God-man and realizing that God loves me passionately in a way that would otherwise be described as madness. He's madly in love with us and for no reason. And he's also inexhaustibly beautiful and the truth of God's word and the saints who are closer to us than our own skin. I mean, this is what shows me that the truth and the goodness and the beauty of the Catholic faith becomes more and more ravishing. Even though I sometimes come up with excuses for not spending time alone or getting away and that kind of thing. And so the great adventure is constant conversion, mm. ongoing, lifelong, but daily. Mm. And not just with the morning offering, but in the afternoon with an examination of conscience, right, right. or in the evening where you're feeling the weight of your own weariness and the need for more mercy. And to me, this is why, I mean, thanks be to God for metanoia, not just the videotape, mm -hmm. the DVDs, but for the message of ongoing conversion mm -hmm. where you just discover how great this love is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, what, I, what I hope in my prayer is, is that we understand that this invitation to metanoia is an invitation that everybody receives. Mm -hmm. That we have a God who is so much bigger, so much greater, so much more, more, more love, more mercy, more hope, more grace, more transformation, that that this becomes transformative in our life. I think sometimes we, we treat the spiritual life as an extracurricular activity, something that some people are really good at, you know, <laughs> you're just really good at this. And, or, or a t-shirt or clothes that we put on for Sunday's best. But it, it, it has to be this shake you to the core of who you are, this encounter with the Lord that, that makes you question everything, who, who, who He is, who God is, who you are, who the world is, this, this moment that we are stripped of everything. There's, 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 there's God and there's me and there's this encounter and there's this revelation and this realization that He is real and because of that it demands some kind of a response from me. And, and my hope is, is that we all have that experience but that it's a continual experience that I'm excited that I may wake up tomorrow, Regis, you said earlier, that, that God would surprise us. Like, it sounds cheesy, but like I look forward to seeing how God's going to surprise me. How is He going to show Himself to me? Um, how is He going to reveal Himself to me? And 
I, I want to pray for a heart and a mind that's continually open to that, that's not put him in this box. It says, okay, I've got that conversion part done. <laughs> What's next? But that yeah, there is no next. There, there, there's this eternal blessing, this eternal presence that is always new, always fresh, always alive. That, yeah, that's my, that's my hope personally for me, and that was really the hope and the prayer for those who view Metanoia. Amen. Well, thank you, Father Dave, for sharing this wonderful ministry with us and this message. And if you want to learn more about today's topic, uh, we have this free handout for you. It's an excerpt from the Leader's Guide uh, for the Metanoia video series. This handout is yours for free by simply going online to faithandreason.com or by calling the number you'll see on the screen in just a moment. Um, my final thoughts on this topic, really, metanoia is a, is a work of the Holy Spirit. And it's so important, you know, if you've heard anything and you thought to yourself, well, I, I could never do that, I could never be that way, I could never be that holy, I just want to affirm that you are so correct <laughs> in that belief. And that's the beautiful thing about the gift that God gives us, particularly in the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. That gift of faith that allows us to see that wafer as the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. That, that gift that we're able to look at our brother and sister or stranger or even enemy and say that we're part of the family of God because we have our Father who art in heaven. And this path to metanoia, this path of intimacy with Jesus Christ, no one can say Jesus is Lord without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so just an encouragement to continue to ask the Holy Spirit in your life uh, to open up your heart, open up your eyes, look for those surprises. Uh, look to see how God wants to woo you in a sense, romance you, uh, uh, educate you, all of those elements that he just wants to draw you closer to his heart. Uh, just to do that through the power of the Holy Spirit to become intimate with Jesus so that we can be led to the Father. That's God's desire for us, that Trinitarian intimacy and love. And so pray that for yourself and please pray that for us here at Franciscan. Pray that for our students. We want our campus to be a place of metanoia, you know, particularly those that get to spend many years here, but not just uh, those that are here for many years. Uh, come to one of our conferences. Uh, look at our media. Everything we're doing here is we're trying to educate, evangelize, and send forth joyful disciples to restore all things in Christ. And we invite you to be a part of that. Father Dave, would you just close us in a prayer? Of course. Heavenly Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to be present upon us at this moment, uh, that you'd make yourself known to us, that your grace would allow us to see that you are the Christ, that you are the Son of the living God. And we choose this day to follow you, uh, to fall in deeper in love with you. May Almighty God pour his blessings on you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357.